You know, we often talk about how, right, those traumas create um, belief systems for us. And those yeah. belief systems are things that we hold on to. Um, and they are often created when we're very young. And um, it's not that that belief system was wrong or bad. We often equate it to like having a favorite pair of pajamas that you used to wear, maybe when you're a one and a half and you ran around in them all day long, you never wanted to take them off. They were comfy, they were great, you loved them a lot. But now that you're older, you can't fit into those pajamas. And the same way, when we get older, we actually find those belief systems don't work for us any longer. So we need to update them. We need to update them into something now that fits who we are and fits the lives that we're currently leading. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Whenever and wherever you are watching or listening, this is The Holistic Monitor, and I'm your host, Nick Sconia. The Holistic Monitor is a wellness podcast featuring life energy research, health and wellness transformation, self-improvement and empowerment, philosophy, spirituality, and now guest interviews as well. We look forward to your comments on our YouTube channel, at Holistic Monitor, and you can also listen on the go with us at Spotify, Amazon Music, Apple Podcasts, and more. And with that, let's get today's show started. Natalie Kolhas, you work, it looks like, integrally with anxiety and ways to, uh, to, to handle anxiety. Is that correct? That's correct. So our primary focus is individuals who are dealing or struggling or challenged with anxiety. Uh, we often find people who do have anxiety have had experiences where they have had some trauma in the past. And often we also notice if people haven't addressed their anxiety, they end up getting pulled into a place of depression. Hmm. So because of that, we are we work with anxiety, but we also work in trauma and in depression as well. Hmm. Okay. And uh, I'm assuming it's not the royal we. Um, you have a, uh, a center or a practice? Yes. yes, I have a practice and I have five other therapists who are also trained uh, in the same modalities. We all work together as a collaborative force um, to ensure that all of the people we're working with are moving forward and getting where they need to go. That's excellent. Okay. And where are you based? We are outside of Atlanta, Georgia, about 30 miles south of Atlanta. Um, in a place called Peachtree City. Hmm. Yep, I've heard of it. Yep. Is that on one of the major interstates? Yes, right off of uh, Highway 85. Okay. Yeah. Peachtree City. Yep. And um, uh, do you see a lot of clients there? Do you have a lot of people coming in from from outside of, uh, of uh, the area? We do. Uh, we have a steady stream of people um, that we see. We're actually very well known. Uh, for what we do. And one of the reasons for that is we have people come in, we provide them what they need, we give them different skills, we can work with them in different ways, um, and we get them to what they need to be actually achieving, where they want to be going. Um, and because of that, we're constantly taking new people in because thankfully we're getting the people so that they're feeling better and they're out about in the world and moving forward. Um, mm -hmm. I know some practices, often it feels like you end up being there for a very long time and there's nothing wrong with that. Um, but for us, we prefer to be able to have people say, we love you, I'm good, goodbye, talk to you <laughs> later um, and have them move on, so. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And that, and then I feel like um, I hear that a lot and I, maybe it's part of society where we want more of a instant uh, fix. Yes. But there also are means and ways for it to be fairly quick instead of kind of dragging on something much longer than it needs to be dragged on for, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, there are a lot of methods out there to handle with different, um, emotional and mental states. Mm -hmm. uh, are you working with specific mod modalities that, uh, uh, target these? 
So we work with something called cognitive behavioral therapy, which is known as CBT. And CBT helps individuals to kind of recognize through psychoeducation the way that they're thinking about things, the way that they're feeling about things, and how they're behaving. We also go through how they can pull apart those thoughts, reframe them, and work with them in a way that feels comfortable and allows them to move forward. Mm. One of the other things that we work with is something called brain spotting. Now, some people have heard of brain spotting, some people have not. A lot of people have heard of something called EMDR, Mm -hmm. which is very well known in the trauma community. Um, And brain spotting is actually the 2.0 version of uh, EMDR. So many studies have been done on this, and we find that it is a gentler process. Um, People can walk away from having um, the process done and they're they're walking away feeling stronger, feeling more centered. Sometimes with EMDR, people feel a little off center, maybe even slightly traumatized by the experience itself. And just knowing we work with so many trauma individuals, the last thing we want is that to occur. So um, brain spotting is um, a way that we can gently approach the subject Um, Their brain can process it out. And then in that, um, it helps them to be able to figure out for themselves what information do they already have that is actually working for them, can work for them, and what they can actually apply in the future. Um, And then the last thing that we do is hypnotherapy. And in hypnotherapy, particularly if people have a lot of anxiety, The great thing about hypnotherapy is we can actually place them in a situation, not maybe too overwhelming, but a situation that's a safe way for them to do it, almost like exposure response. So they can get into that situation, they can freeze it, they can do what they want to, they can create a person who's there with them if they would like, if they want their wingman or their support person. It gives a lot of opportunities for people to really recognize not only how can they respond in an anxious situation, but to think about where did that come from? Where did that maybe concern or worry or fear begin and how did it begin? And does it make sense now that they understand that, that they're applying it to the current situation? And in those types and all those types of modalities, it really helps kind of pull together a really good picture for them on how to approach it. Again, whether it's a trauma situation, whether they're in a place of depression, or they are just battling through their anxiety, trying to get out into life and do what they would like to be able to do. Have more freedom. Of mm-hmm. themselves, right? Mm-hmm. But, uh, just to circle back, EMDR, what does that stand for? So that is eye, um, eye movement. Oh, goodness, I can't remember now. Um, Direct response or something like that? or Eye movement, EM. Yeah. Hmm. It's like it just slipped out of my head. That happens, yeah. <laughs> so, you, don't do, um, you don't do the EMDR, right? We don't do the MDR. No. Um, so the EMDR, uh, brain spotting, uses the same principle where we're actually using the eyes. Yeah. Um, but EMDR has the eyes moving back and forth and back and forth and back and forth while the information is being processed. Right. We have found that um, there's not a, you know, they do that because when we're sleeping, right, our remember. brain is processing information as our bra- as our eyes are moving back and forth. Um, But it has been found that really that information is being held in what's called one spot. Mm, So mm. I often tell people, like, if I were to ask you, so Nick, tell me about what were you doing this weekend? You may look around and go, "Um, what was I doing this weekend, this past week? Oh, I remember. And in that, you've actually looked around inside your brain to try to find that information. And once you find it, You pull it out and then you share it with me in the same way if I were to say, so who is your third grade teacher? We literally look around in our brain, Mm -hmm. find that information, and it's the spot that our brain 
holds that information. And once we find that spot, now we can tell somebody about it and we bring it into our conscious memory. So when we're doing brain spotting, we're looking for these spots where that information is being held and the person can process out that situation, that emotion, and that feeling. So instead of doing the movement consistently, kind of forcing a, a search, yes. uh, but without like, um, without uh, liberation, without it being able to go where it needs to go. Yes. Just getting the eyes moving to kind of track and get the, the, the mind kind of in search mode. Yes. This goes more for, you know, look for this, look for the area where the file cabinet is or whatever it might be. Correct. Yes. Yeah. Yes, exactly. It sounds like the method of brain spotting and hypnotherapy are very similar mm -hmm. in that um, doing a lot of searching inwardly. Do you start with hypnotherapy to get them at a certain brain frequency in a theta state or something like that, mm -hmm. and then begin uh, the brain spotting to start your process? What what uh, is typical for you as far as with clients to start with? So often what we will do is I may actually start with a hypnotherapy. And some of that is because I want them to be able to remember how to relax. Mm. A lot of people have been on hyper-focus, um, particularly people with PTSD. Um, they're very hyper-focused on everything around them and their body is now in that fight, flight, freeze mode. And right. so I want their body to remember what it feels like to actually calm down, feel secure and be in a place where they know that they can um, move forward easily. So I will often start maybe with doing some hypnotherapy, literally just as a skill training piece. Mm -hmm. um, I'll do um, a recording for them so that they can listen to it again over and over again, but it allows the body to relax, to calm down. And as you stated, right, we're bringing them into a theta wave state where it is that stage right between being awake and being asleep. It's that, that middle zone right there. Mm -hmm. And in that middle zone, we do find we're able to pull up a lot of information. The thing that is similar between the brain spotting and the hypnotherapy is we're actually utilizing all of the brain. People think that when you're in a place of hypnosis, you don't know what you're talking about or, you have no power, no will, all of which is television, movies, mm -hmm. not true whatsoever. Um, you are, we are actually keeping your awake brain online, just like we do with brain spotting. But then we're activating the unconscious part of the brain at the same time so they can actually talk with each other. What happens is we're often in a place where we're just thinking something like maybe we know something. Oh, I know that that road doesn't cause me anxiety, but I'm going to avoid it because every time I've been there, suddenly I have a panic attack, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? So they may know it. They know it doesn't make sense, but they're feeling it. And our feelings are being held in our unconscious part of the brain. That's the part that I call our library. Like you were talking about the file cabinet. It's mm -hmm. a library with all kinds of of stacks of books and information and files, all the things that have happened to us in our life are in the library. And that is a library full of sensations, emotions, and feelings. And so I want us to actually have all of the brain talking to each other. When we have the thinking part talking and the emotional part talking and everybody is together, that is when we can actually move you forward. If we're just stopped, and like, let's just think about it all day long, but we don't bring in the feeling piece, it's very hard. Um, what we know is about 10% of our brain is logical thinking and 90% of our brain is in all of our automatic functions and emotions and feelings. Mm. So I equate it to having a tug of war. You got 10 people on one side and then you have 90 people on the other and you're doing this battle between what you know and what you feel and believe it or not, you get pulled into what you feel. 
Yeah. So this is when we use these modalities, we get all of the brain online using what all the means that we can. So now everybody pulls exactly all in the same direction. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now there used to be a thing where they'd say we only use, you know, 2% of our brain or whatever. Yeah. Um, but I think that what they, what they mean by that is in a given task or in a given moment um, that, that certain percentage is being utilized to do the activity. Yes. That the whole thing is going that, that you know, there's electricity happening at all points, you know, yeah. um, that, that utilization is purely, you know, um, on a focused point of what's, what the operation is, that section of the brain will fire off or something like that. But mm -hmm. that for that to happen, it has to communicate with the other parts and pieces of itself. Yes. to uh, collaborate and to, you know, generate images and all sorts of extra stuff that, you know, we barely know anything about. Or maybe we're, maybe we're learning more about it. But <laughs> More and more and more. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. We're just learning just how amazing that, that system is. So, yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of promise with uh, AI that it's going to help us mm -hmm. to delve into the depths of the, of the workings of the brain because it's, mm -hmm. it's that involved. And, uh, oh, yes. Intense. Yes, so involved. Yeah. And then once you touch into um, the emotional world and, um, and you know, different levels of experience and uh, perception, then it's a, a whole different uh, whole different story. It gets even more deep. And I, I don't know that AI is really going to be able to help us with the things that are really human, you know, mm -hmm. really organic. It's not going to be able to comprehend things that are uh, of a you know, more esoteric level. So yeah, so it's what it's very interesting that the um, that there has to be so many different things firing off at the same time to orchestrate, you know, a simple process of us like eating breakfast or something like that. That so many things are being brought in, so many perceptions. Yes, and it's actually been recorded that our conscious brain is processing at 2,000 bytes every single second. Mm -hmm. wow. And what is really interesting is the part of our brain that holds all of our emotions and our feelings, our unconscious brain, is actually working at 400 million mm. bytes in one second. Wow. And I often explain that to people. That's like having an older computer that had four gigs and that computer would be filled up in exactly one second. Hmm. But our brain does that over and over and over all day long for us. Right. And it's it's really recording everything. That's mm -hmm. been my experience that, that I've had is... Um, I work a lot for myself on trying to do memory recall into yes. my past and it helps when I find like a, a pinpointed spot. You could call it brain spotting. Yes. Um, you're doing a self spot. Yeah. yeah. And uh, when I dwell there and work around that and just let myself kind of exist in that moment, um, it opens up other memories from that point. When I was uh, 11, I knew that I was forgetting um, a lot of my younger years. I, I actually had to like make a conscious decision to get rid of like a little saved pieces of paper and little uh, keepsake type of little bin that I had. Yes. Knowing that I was going to lose all of those memories by getting rid of that bin. Um, and I remembered a time when I was really young and I realized I was forgetting things of when I was younger. I, I don't know how old. I, I want to say five, but I don't really know what the age was. But I can now go back to the point in time when I was like 11 or 12 to zo zoom in on that time frame mm -hmm. of when I still remembered things much easier, yes. even further back. Yes. And I can still remember that time way before that I remember forgetting like yes. the beginning of me forgetting things. And um, I don't know why it's played such a big role in my life like that, but I've kind of had this ability to dwell back to that 
-hmm. And then when I'm there longer, I start to pick up more, more things going on. Uh, it's like that for everybody. Yes. You know, it's not uh, a special power or anything like that. I feel like it's, I feel like everybody needs to be doing that kind of thing where they're accessing mm -hmm. what I would call who they are, you know, yes. what their impulses are, what's their drive. Yeah. Um, and another anomaly would be the, what is now known from the Harry Potter um, world of, of the Horcrux, mm -hmm. which is these strong emotional moments mm -hmm. that actually um, take in everything like a snapshot mm -hmm. and kind of uh, what we call congeal yes. the energy and yes. uh, create instead of light being able to pass easy, it has, it hits this block, it uh, swerves, it gets all messed up trying mm -hmm. to get from A to B. Um, does the brain spotting work to kind of, um, by going back and experiencing it, uh, does it work to discharge those congealed moments of trauma? Yes, so um, it does. What we're actually doing is we're going in at an emotional level and we'll use something that was maybe a recent emotion. So let's say that they had a recent emotion where they were feeling overwhelmed. And so we'll find that spot where they had that experience and they were feeling overwhelmed. And then what we do is when we focus in on that, we allow the brain, as you had mentioned, the brain often then follows a trail of, then it starts to remember another time it felt overwhelmed, and mm -hmm. then another time it felt overwhelmed, and another time that overwhelm was there. And it starts, and I say it's like opening up all these different files that are there where that feeling is. And when we open up all of them and we throw them all out on the table, what we can do is we can sort through them and we can decide well, we have 26 of these. Really, we only need one. Let's get rid of 25 of them. Mm -hmm. um, and we'll keep this one because it's important. Then we'll also bring in maybe another piece of information that wasn't there, but we know is actually useful. So we have all these little librarians running around, pulling all these files, throwing them out, going, oh, and remember this. I remember when they did really, really well with being, a, and they bring that in and they put that in. And what happens is the brain starts to reorganize mm -hmm. and release out the emotion where maybe it had so much of it. And then when we're done, if we had a big gigantic stack that was like this of all this, we've actually gone through and we've made it small. So it's a smaller, more manageable stack now of emotional residue. Mm -hmm. So when they now get into that place, rather than getting what we call triggered, right. where you're actually not only responding to the current experience, but all those other experiences that are similar in a trigger, that now has become smaller. And now you're responding actually to the moment. So mm. you're not reacting to maybe something that has happened in the past, but you're able to respond to the current situation in a way that feels better, feels more empowering. And in that process, your brain does what it needs to do to release that out and reorganize it. So now you can move forward. Um, it's really just an amazing process when the brain does that. Yeah, definitely. And uh, so you're basically able to more act and uh, more closely act directly instead of react based off of past stimulus of that uh, response yes. or that trigger, that smell or whatever it might be. Yes, exactly. It's kind of amazing how um, all-encompassing the that uh, trauma can create this mm -hmm. response to so many different stimulus. Um, yeah. All those different associations, right? It begins to create these associations, whether it's a, a smell or a song um, or a season can create associations. Right. All of those things build up and they're all being held in our little library of our brain. And all of that is being used in a way that our brain feels like that's useful for us. Yeah. Um, and typically it is until it's not. And right. then when it's not, that's when we often have people walk in because they're like, this is not working for me anymore. Right. And they have to do something. And yeah. So so you get a lot of PTSD 
We do. We have a lot of PTSD clients, um, whether that is trauma from uh, relationships or experiences. Um, nowadays, we have a lot of kids who are coming in who are too afraid to go to school. Mm, um, just all the, the things that are happening in the news. Right. Um, I understand like the schools have to do processes where they like lock the kids down to mm -hmm. prepare them. Um, but actually what happens is they often get traumatized by that and then trying to work through with them those situations. Um, all of those things are growing more and more every yeah. day. And we're seeing more of those. With working with um, that response that we have mm -hmm. kind of built into us from a young age, we're working in our daily life every day. We go out to work, we drive down the road, we get these responses that um, put us into different head spaces and mm -hmm. kind of color our day. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes in a good way, sometimes in a bad way. It can go both ways. Do you work to build in positive experiences for your clients so that instead of having that negative trigger, they can work on having something as a, as a fallback to like a positive space or something like that? Yes, definitely. So we're always looking for people to have what we call balance. Right. So our automatic system often goes off and we talk about how we get our, a fear response and a fear response goes and it goes and, and it's programmed because it has one mission and it only has one mission. Fear's mission is to make sure that we're safe. That's it. Right. It wants us to be emotionally safe. It wants us to be physically safe. It has no desire for us to be happy. Right. It just wants us to be safe. And so, right, this is that old system that goes off constantly in our brain. And so what we know is we need to have some balance for that, um, finding balance. So what happens is we work a lot with people. People often think that anxiety um, and fear are exactly the same thing. Mm. They also think that anxiety is supporting fear. And saying you actually have to do what fear is saying. And what we work with people in is having them recognize they are two completely different things. Right. And anxiety nowadays has kind of in our brains has moved into a place where it walks along with fear, mm -hmm. seeing what fear is doing. But if fear starts pulling you in a direction that number one is telling you something that's not 100% accurate right? or two telling you something that is going to go against your values hmm. or three going to take away an opportunity that life is uh, presenting for you. This is when we actually start feeling anxiety. Hmm. So anxiety works as a gatekeeper. It's watching over fear to see is fear telling us information that actually is okay. Now, anxiety wants us to be safe. That's, you know, it's like, yeah, definitely. If it's telling you don't go down that alley with the guys with the black hoods and the baseball bats, your anxiety is going to sit down. It's going to be like, oh yeah, listen to that right now. <laughs> definitely listen to that guy. Mm -hmm. But if it's trying to tell you you're not, you can't drive on the highway and get to work and fear's telling you that, now your anxiety is going to come up mm. because it's trying to get your attention to help you recognize something about this doesn't make sense, isn't accurate. Something about that is pulling you away from your values of being able to support yourself, be independent, be, you know, a citizen and good, you know, father figure for your family or whatever. Um, and it's taking away all kinds of opportunities if you can't get on the road. So in any of those situations, this is when our anxiety comes online and we work with people. So they begin to differentiate between the two and realize they are not the same things. Anxiety is not supporting fear. It's watching it, monitoring it and letting you know when it's actually pulling you in the wrong direction, which would be maybe lots and lots of negative thoughts, lots of lots of horrible things. And it does everything in its possible 
arsenal to try to get your attention. No. What we know, right, is fear is telling us that there is um, what we call the proverbial tiger. Mm -hmm. So it's a tiger, fear, fear, threat, threat. And anytime it starts telling us that there's a tiger in the room and there is not a tiger in the room, this is when we start feeling anxiety. So it is a different way of viewing and working with anxiety to realize anxiety is actually there to help you. It wants you to follow your values. It mm -hmm. wants you to take those opportunities. It actually believes that you can go out, gather your own information and make a decision on your own. It doesn't like it when fear is making decisions about your life for you, particularly if you actually don't have information about that. So as we were talking about, right, our brain gathers up a bunch of information from the past. And so fear will say, well, that happened in the past. That means for certain 100% it's going to happen again in the future. And we know logically that doesn't make sense, but we start listening to it. And so then we start subtracting, subtracting, subtracting from our lives until eventually we end up in a place where we don't have the people in our lives, the situations in our lives. We don't have um, the support in our lives. Um, maybe we just end up in our room, in our bed, not getting up. And you know what? Now you're going to be safe and fear is going to want you to stay there. But you don't have a life. And this is where your anxiety comes on because it's trying to pull you out of that situation and pull you into your life. Yeah. yeah. So anxiety seems like it's uh, it's the firing of all the brain's impulses to try and find a source. Like it's the search yes. to try and connect the fear to whatever. Um, it's that electrical charge and it's it causes havoc in that moment. Um, so it's used, so it's useful to find it as a tool for good. Yes. For guidance, um, to make fear be proper, like instead yes. of being just triggered. Correct. Yes. Okay. And so that's why we have both. That's why we have fear and anxiety. If all we had was fear, we would probably no one would ever be going anywhere or doing anything. Right. And, and uh, the electricity that, that spark uh, can nullify the fear. Yes. And so anxiety us. actually brings energy into mm -hmm. our system. Right, right. And so that energy can now be used to go out, explore, find out our own information. See, was that really a tiger or not? Was fear correct? And that, I will tell you, 99% of the time, he's not. <laughs> right. He's not correct. <laughs> we do fine. We do fine. But when we go out, we actually find out for ourselves and we realize, well, that wasn't so bad. Or maybe that was actually fun. Or maybe yeah. I actually had a good time. Or maybe I actually made it. You know, all those kind of things. But he just doesn't even want us to go there or do that. Right. All right. So liberating from fear, that's a, a definitely a goal. Yes. Um, giving us more freedom of movement, freedom in our lives of expression. Mm -hmm. And um, are you having really good uh, success stories? A lot of clients are reporting, you know, very positive benefits. And yes, very much so. So um, it's interesting, you know. I've I've heard I've been doing this for a little over twenty years, and I've I've heard from my clients before. Um, they say, you know, the way you talk about anxiety, I've never heard anybody talk about anxiety the way you do. Yeah. Um, and then they say, you know, you should write a book about that. <laughs> um, and of course I was like, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and then eventually just this past year, I, I actually did come up with a book okay. and, um, I listened to my patients. I listened <laughs> to them and followed their advice, um, and came out with a book and kind of walk people through what it is that we do, because again, you know, we're in a world right now where, we're just seeing levels of um, mental health and anxiety 
uh, and of course fear is spurring our anxiety levels to just be getting more and exploding and moving out so much. Mm -hmm. Um, and we're only, you know, so many people, we can only see so many people at a time. We get such a great success rate with our clients. My hope is that this is something that can reach more people, um, so that they can learn these skills, these techniques, talk about them with their friends, maybe go through some of them with a therapist, um, but really help them to begin to recognize that they have a lot more possibility in life than um, we currently are hearing or thinking and thus experiencing at this point. Okay, and speaking on um, that, there's a lot going on in the world, uh, a lot of uh, tragedy, a lot of crazy news and it may be that we just have more access to the news or it's more pervasive in our lives that we're seeing more of things that were always going on but it does seem like there's a lot of tragedy and a lot of uh very difficult um things happening in a lot of different corners of the world and sometimes right in our backyard yes are you doing outreach in any way to um uh, you know, places where they're having a lot of trouble to help work people through their current situations, traumas. Yes. Yes. So we actually do quite a bit of outreach. We work a lot within our community. Uh, we also um, are trying to work with the Wounded Warrior Project mm. to bring forward some of these kind of techniques and skills for the individuals who you know, have been in extreme situations. And those types of situations are also just our weather is changing dramatically. Yeah. Uh, we're seeing a lot more um, situations where people are experiencing flooding, um, tornadoes, hurricanes. All of these are very traumatizing. Yeah. Uprooting families, um, loss of homes, loss of individuals. You know, COVID came. A lot of stuff happened with that. Um mm -hmm made everybody go home. And I say, just made everybody go and actually sit with themselves. Um, and people either enjoyed that or they realized, hmm, maybe that's not working so well for me. I need to right. do something a little bit different. <laughs> um, and so all of these situations, right, has kind of prompted us to try to get out as much as we can. So, yeah. you know, we have the book, we do outreach within the community. Um, and then we also have an online course for mm -hmm. individuals. So they can get like seven days of therapy for it's like $45 or something like that, the online course. Mm -hmm. But we're trying as much as we can to provide a lot of these things um, because again, it, it's just growing and growing. And we realize that um, we need to also be growing in our response and trying to reach as many people as we can. Um, I do a lot of training with, um, people who have completed their graduate studies um, to be therapists. Mm -hmm. And I train them so they sit with us, they see what we do, they watch the methods, they learn from the methods, they then apply the methods, we talk about it. So I'm working with students as well, trying to ensure that we're growing more and more therapists and counselors who are trained in these methods so that they can actually go out and continue to do this work. Um, so we have a lot of uh, different things that we're, you know, addressing in ways that we're trying to be um, kind of that guiding light in a world that right now does feel very dark for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. um, but we do always want people to know you are not alone. Yeah, We're here your neighbors are probably feeling the same things you can share you can talk you will find often that you're not so far apart um and when we recognize we're not alone and we come together in a place of cooperation um, that really starts breaking down where we often feel this competition competition only pulls us apart cooperation brings us together so we're trying so hard to instill a sense of cooperation within our community and within our clients. Yeah. 
Yeah, competitions for playing games. Mm -hmm. It's great for sports or activities. Uh, yeah. that, that's where it should stop. I mean, <laughs> after that, then it's just uh, animal behavior. Yes. You know, then you have to get community oriented. Well, yeah. that's great. You're doing a lot of outreach, it sounds like, and mm -hmm. a lot of spreading too, as far as training the method, uh, which is a very important part is to get more people doing the work and, mm -hmm. you know, activating. Um, you work specifically with uh, therapists from a specific uh, like course, like uh, social workers, psychologists. What's your uh, typical um, person, student that you would Students teach? that we have. So um, we will work with social workers. We'll work with um, psychologists. We work with um, counselors. There's so many different names for them. Mm -hmm. um, in that and i have lots of different schools that reach out to us so what we also find is if they're pursuing licensure if they're mm -hmm. moving forward um often you have to have something that's called supervision and supervision typically needs to be within your professional arena so Scope. if you need yeah. if you're going to be a social worker you're going to need someone who is a social worker to supervise you before you can become licensed. Mm -hmm. If you're a psychologist, you'll need someone who's a psychologist to supervise you before you become licensed. And so once we hit that point, then I typically just work with people who are um, pursuing professional licensed counseling. Mm -hmm. um, and then there, then I'll provide supervision for them in that arena. Um, it is the same medical model that doctors follow where you go to school, you learn it, then you have to go to the hospital, you have to follow somebody around, you have to see how it's done, then you step into all these different things and you try on a whole bunch of different things and you mm -hmm. literally practice it all until eventually they deem you, you can put on your white coat and you can go out in the world. Right. Um, and they do the same thing with counselors. You know, yeah. you can't just go to school, you have to go through the same steps. It takes quite a bit of time um, but again, you just want someone who's feeling competent um, to be able to provide the care that the other person needs. And, you know, your clients want them to know that you actually know what you're doing and why what you're doing is something that will get them where they need to go. Right. Right. Yeah, that's great. And uh, what was the name of the book? Or is the name so the book? my book is called Hello Anxiety, My Old Friend. <laughs> that's great. Yeah. And it is your friend, right? So that's an important part of the uh, of the storyline here. <laughs> it, it actually is your friend and we kind of have known it for a very long time. I always tell people it's like having a very obnoxious friend follow you around all day long mm. <laughs> telling you what it wants you to do and don't do that and it's just constant going off in the background but it does that just like a friend because it cares about you it's yeah. not doing it because it doesn't so right right and your your center's name so um we're called serenity tree mm -hmm. and we're the anxiety and brain spotting institute for the south side of atlanta okay yeah and so easy access for people coming from far away yes um do you do anything you, you said i believe you said you do this on zoom as well or on uh, yes yeah. so we provide telehealth um as well as in person um and so we're able to you know connect with people in different places um our licensure is in the state of georgia so if we're going to work with people outside of the state, we'll do more of what's called like a coaching mm. where we, we're working with coaching with them. Yeah. Um, right. Because again, you have to be careful that you're not stepping outside of lines and right. zones. Uh, yeah. I know right now we're very happy that we're starting to get um, licensure that's going to cover a lot of different areas and states. Mm -hmm. um, and the hope is that we can get that nationalized. So yeah. people can reach and get individuals who really specialize in certain areas, even if they're not right next door to them and they can have that access. Right. And that, and it's a lot of that jumping through hoops is just state lines, the differences in laws that happen 
uh, as far as you know, the terminology has to change a bit. Yes, yes. The methodology is still basically the same. The results will be the same. It's just that you can't use certain terms because that terms, would be crossing exactly. the, the boundary, yes. right? Yes, exactly. Just fairly silly, but that's the way it is. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, you have a website as well where people can yes. find you? So um, you can find information about me and the book on helloanxiety.net. Okay. And then you can find information about our practice at serenitytreehouse.com. Excellent. Yeah. Serenity Treehouse. Um, is, is that a reference at all to the, the peach tree city? To or? the peach tree city. So, <laughs> no, it was. it's more of... Um, we started out with a center of Serenity House, and then we branched into a learning section. And we were going with mm. the tree of learning um, and providing yeah. an opportunity for everybody to come and sit under the tree, share their information, and provide that information not only to each other, but take that out. And so it slowly morphed into Serenity Tree, but we kept the house because yeah. <laughs> we originally started with the house. Yeah. So we have serenitytreehouse.com. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, that's fantastic. That's a great, uh, great name. Great symbolism. Yes. And uh, I, I love the message. I love what you're doing. Really uh, glad to see that this is getting adopted widely. Uh, big fan of clearing trauma in my own life. And when possible, I love to help other people out. And it sounds like that's exactly what you're doing really nice to uh, hear that there's another system there that's going to be out and being used by therapists that will help get rid of those dominant strains of, of trauma that try to run our lives. Yes, yes. We often talk about how, right, those traumas create um, belief systems for us. And those yeah. belief systems are things that we hold on to. Um, and they are often created when we're very young. And um, it's not that that belief system was wrong or bad. We often equate it to like having a favorite pair of pajamas that you used to wear, maybe when you're a one and a half and you ran around in them all day long, you never wanted to take them off. They were comfy, <laughs> they were great, you loved them a lot. But now that you're older, you can't fit into those pajamas. In the same way, when we get older, we actually find those belief systems don't work for us any longer. So we need to update them. We need to right. update them into something now that fits who we are and fits the lives that we're currently leading. Yeah, much like a computer needs an upgrade. Exactly. It needs to have its uh, systems rebooted and yeah. Yes. Wow, it's amazing. Well, again, thank you for being here and sharing your message and we'll help get the word out. Great. Thank you so much, Nick. I had a great time talking with you.